inviting to the podium uh, Apollo Flight Director and Legend Gene Krantz. Good morning and uh, thank you. Uh, uh, I think the story of the restoration starts many years ago. When I retired, basically, uh, I thought mission control was in reasonably good shape. We'd been flying missions there. But the facility was abandoned principally in about 1996. Uh, no more missions. They moved over to the new control facility. I would uh, tour many groups that would come there, VIPs. I spoke to the co-ops and the interns programs that went through there. And before I uh, spoke to the people, I'd have to go through and police the room. Sort of clean up the stuff that was left in the consoles, get rid of the water bottles, Coke cans. Uh, there was stuff occasionally in waste baskets that were around there. But basically, this place was not representative of historic mission control. And when I took the VIPs down, I point out this yellow duct tape that was holding our carpeting together. The configuration of the consoles in no way represented uh, where we were and what we did. And the uh, facility, the tools we had at hand when we were flying Apollo and Skylab, nor even in the early shuttle program. I was frustrated. Maybe it was uh, associated with somebody in the trench did this. They put all three abort switches in the flight dynamics console which was uh, really sort of an issue related to configuration, but basically the people had taken souvenirs from the consoles. They punched out the intercom lights, they had removed them, put them in their pocket. They did the same thing up in the viewing room. They talked about making the uh, tops for the ashtrays. They were all gone. And it was interesting to hear you occasionally you run across a generational thing when I'd be taking a tour through there, and occasionally we'd get up in the waiting room, and one of these teenagers would say, I didn't know that you had cell phones in your days. And I was trying to figure out what they were talking about. And I asked them, and they said, no, these are the holders. The ashtrays behind the seats were for the uh, cell phones. But basically, that was something I had, it was unfortunately I'd come to accept. This was not right. And then one day I got a call from Sandra. And I don't know what her, prompted her to call me, but basically she says, you know, the National Park Service is establishing mission control as an endangered facility. And I don't know what I was doing. I had something else going, so I asked Ed to come to a meeting with her. But that started a journey that I thought would be very easy when we started but it's far from easy. Uh, Ed and I knew it had to be done. We thought we could corral some people and get on with it. But the kinds of problems we faced as we went through this, quite independent of money, was what was the configuration and mission control? What are we going to build? What does it look like? And we found out that most of the configuration data that Philco and the contractors had used was no longer there. We had to basically start off with the configuration for Apollo 15. Uh, we tried to work with the, uh, many of the uh, current elements or the present prior elements in, in Johnson Space Center, and we just weren't communicating with them. This became sort of a whose room is this? And it was a question of uh, ownership. But eventually we solved that problem. But the next problem we faced was the one associated with finances. And I went out and I started consulting various uh, museums around here to try and find out is there anybody that might be interested and contributed. I went to the uh, Saber Pilots Association, very groups that I talked to, and I'd always make a short pitch. But then uh, one day, and I, and I were over in the Space Center Houston, and we were sitting down trying to figure out what's next. And Tracy Lamb and Mr. Harris came down. and. Uh, Somehow or other that day, I knew things were going to get better. And they did. 
they started this fundraising campaign and when they, they, they indicated that the city of Winchester had contributed a major amount to this, boy, we were euphoric. I mean, it was just unbelievable. They, uh, they challenged, they, we stepped forward, we were ready, we were ready to go, let's go do something. But that wasn't quite enough and then I found out uh, what a Kickstarter was about. And this was a, uh, another major step. But the process came together, this community, this nation, the people started contributing. Uh, a team was formed at Johnson Space Center that was literally miraculous in its ability. Uh, Jim down there was really a hard-nosed project manager. And I mean, we had some pretty interesting battles down there. But then we had to figure out, it talked this last night, how to get money. The money was raised, now how do you get it in the hands of the government to work this project? Well, I'm going a bit too long right now, but uh, basically I went and saw a mission control uh, last Monday. And I walked into that healing room, and it was dazzling, overwhelmed. You just couldn't believe this. All of a sudden, you were 50 years younger, and you wanted to work in that, a walk back in that room and work. And it's uh, interesting, the, uh, you walk into this room, and you look around there, and you start listening to voices. And you hear voices in their room. It's no ordinary place. This is where decisions are made. The words are crisp, concise, urgent, go or no go. And if you listen more closely, you can start picking out the operational positions in that room. The flight directors, the systems, the trajectory people. As words become clearer, you now recognize who's speaking. You recognize Kraft's voice, directing the spacecraft community, the communicator, to get Ed White back in the spacecraft in the Gemini 4 mission. Your pal, uh, 11 crew asked, give us a reading on that program alarm. And see Bale's answers. John Aaron, during Apollo 12, crisply addresses the crew's request. We had a blackout on board the spacecraft, and he tells the flight director, turn SCE to AUX. Dick Tharson was one of the magic guys in that room. And this is, I imagine, what the people in the viewing room were thinking when he heard his words tell the flight director, to tell the flight director, have the crew hit the abort switch with the flashlight. <laughs> and uh, this was their troubleshooting and abort indication <laughs> on the uh, shade tree mechanic, yes. And then there's uh, really the historic moments in that room when Borman, Anders, and Lovell a reading from the book of Genesis on Christmas Eve. This was a magic time, Glenn, and if we were all in there, and basically I was just sitting, I wasn't flight director for that mission, so I was enjoying that moment. And these words from Genesis were like words from heaven. We had listened to Jim Lovell saying, Houston, we got a problem. And now that you're understanding and listening to these words, they're starting to take shape and you see young men in white shirts with skinny ties and pocket protectors. <laughs> Seated above us in the row behind, in the viewing room, you can feel the presence of leadership, strong leaders, ones who are there at the right place at the right time, and I wonder, where did we get such men like Dr. Bill Ruth, Chris Kraft, Sage Schober, Geek Slate, Max Viget? You sense the youth in that room and the exuberance of the voices strong, cocky, and authoritative. Voices from New York and Pennsylvania, some from the countryside of Alabama, Texas, Oklahoma, and Iowa. These voices are very honest and direct because we were not politically correct in those days. Personalities flourished in mission control and in our offices and it generated an organizational chemistry that was greater than the sum of the parts. And now that you're familiar with the room and the people and the voices, you start looking around and you see this blue-gray globe glow in the front of the room from the displays that established the mystique of the people in the trench, the trajectory team. 
Near one of these controllers are several P tubes, a third, uh, like the caissons that were fired off the artillery. They said the uh, feet of a former artilleryman named John O'Ellen. There's a bouquet of roses from an unknown admirer on the floor under the world map. Smoke covers in the air, and you can't believe how much smoke was in there. It was the <laughs> controllers and bosses, pressure alert, and pipe, cigar, cigarette smoke so thick that when you took your clothes off at home, your wife said, where you been? <laughs> she thought you were at the local bar. The one thing I had and complained about the accuracy of the restoration with Sandra, and I lost this one. I didn't want to clean the return air ducts in there because they were black with the coal tar from the cigarettes. <laughs> in this room, there's an aroma. It comes from the coffee pot that had overflowed and burned in the plate by the hallway door. And a contrast with the aroma of the banana peels and the waste baskets and the empty boxes from the pizza and fried chicken. But this is our home, this is our mission control, it's a battleground of the space race, the place where we won the high ground. Here we set the records and returned every crew we launched safely. And before it became a catchphrase, we had the crews back. We were the teams, proud of our personnel and the team colors we carried. And over the missions, we became much more. We, came, we became brothers in a cause. It did not matter whether we worked in the control room, support staff rooms, recovery room, sim control area, bat cave, computing complex, all in this building. We're the ones with our crews who carried our nation's flag to the moon. It was our crusade. The pledge we had made to our president, John F. Kennedy, and to Gus Gresham, Ed White, Roger Chaffee. This room that you're going to walk into is our mission control. Many have left us, and for the Apollo generation, our time is rapidly coming to an end. And I pray that the room that you'll be going into will continue to inspire and drive the current and future teams to complete the work that we began and carry our nation forward to return to the moon and beyond. Thank you.